Hey, it's Doug here in the CCM Cafe, the man, the myth, the legend. Mike Donahue is here. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate you, my friend. <laughs> We're just playing one of those <laughs> hand games. We didn't want it to be awkward for you, but welcome to our conversation. Yes, thank you. So, I'm a firm believer that we go through stuff not only for what God wants to teach us, but so that when we're on the other side, you know, we share it. could be encouraging someone else. Um, I know you've shared this story before, but in this platform, talk a little bit about uh, your senior year in high school, opposition, <laughs> to say the least, that you came up against, and as an encouragement for someone that might find themselves maybe not in the exact situation, but how do you work through that and get on the other side? Yeah. Yeah, one thing we really believe, or at least I believe, is that God is a redeemer, which means he takes things that we would think, there's no reason I should have gone through that. I didn't want, that was horrible. And then he has a way of using that very thing to bring about something beautiful, i.e. the cross, right? Uh, so for me, I, w I, got, I got killed in a car accident. Dead, I was dead. Uh, got thrown out of a flipping car in high school uh, and flatlined five times on the way to the hospital. And after months of laying on my back, uh, my parents gave me a guitar because I didn't have anything to do while I was sitting there. From, my back was broken in a couple places. I should say I was brought back to life. The paramedics, yeah. I'm, I'm not a zombie. I, was, I died and I was brought back to life. Uh, and I started playing the guitar as a result. And so... It was funny because I never shared that story when our band, 10th Avenue North, first started. And then we were doing the struggle tour and we we're talking about a song called Warn, Let Me See Redemption Win, Let Me Know the Struggle Ends, You Can Mend a, a Heart That's Frail and Torn. I want to know a song can rise from the ashes of a broken life and all that's dead inside can be reborn. And my buddy, who we've been friends for a long time, he goes, you should, uh, you should intro that song with your car accident because that is exactly what happened to you. A song rose out of your broken life. I said, that's a good idea. <laughs> so the encouragement, the takeaway is, obviously you, you never gave up. Yeah, I'm sure. Th I no, mean, I will. In terms of these, you know, the doctor, what, what was it? It's doom and gloom. I mean, my goodness, how do you? You know, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter six, one Corinthians, uh, and it basically says that in our, in our grief, the Holy Spirit comforts us so that we can then go comfort others in their distress. I think maybe the word's distress. And I think that's, that's what it was. I, I would love to chalk it up to, yeah, I made it. I wouldn't die. Um, but I mean, obviously my body was trying to give up on me. Yeah. kept flatlining. So I have to chalk that up to... The Holy Spirit wanted me around, I guess. Life is a series of seasons. You mentioned 10th Avenue North, of course, huge success. Huge. Chart topping. Huge. I mean, up here. Yeah, probably, pr probably the biggest band ever. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. under Coldplay. Okay. <laughs> you and Stones kind of neck and neck. Yeah, for yeah, right there. Right there. 2020, you guys decide to disband. Right before the pandemic. I mean, we could not have picked a worse time. Nobody remembers. I was like, wait, what? Well, oh, right. Global pandemic happened a week later. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, it's crazy. I said to the band, I need to take some time off. I had never, it had been 15 years. I mean, we had been touring nonstop for over 15 years, and I had never taken any time off. Everyone else had, because you can get a fill-in guitarist, but if you have a fill-in lead singer, people are upset. Yeah, I don't know. yeah, yeah. So uh, I said, I need to take the fall off. And everyone in the band went, actually, I'm actually, really, actually, actually, actually. And everyone had all these plans. And they said, look, this has been awesome. We've done, I don't know, six albums, seven albums, eight albums, if you count Christmas albums. I don't know. We did a bunch of music, right. toured all over the world. And they just said, I, we're done. We're, we want to raise families. And we want to feel what it's like to be off the road and do something different. And so everyone imagines if we, when a band breaks up, especially if they could have kept going, they're like, well, what happened? You guys must have, you know. And the truth of it, we're having a little reunion next month. Not a band reunion, but the band is reuniting around a, around a thing. And, um, yeah, it was beautiful because they all said, you should, 
you could keep calling yourself 10th Avenue North if you want to. We know you're going to keep making music. And I just said to him, I feel like that would dishonor you guys. Mm. Like, yeah, didn't need you anyway. I'll get a bunch of new guys. I'm still 10th Avenue North. We always said 10th Avenue was this group. So, uh, so now, I'm, now I'm Mike Donnie. So I guess for people that might be fearful of a change of a season, it doesn't sound like there was re any real fear or trepidation for anyone. You had this inner peace that for you, it was the right decision, and then it was just echoed. In the moment, we all had incredible peace. And okay. then every day after, I'd be going, what did we do? <laughs> Why did we do that? Uh, and, and even, I sh uh, should I keep using the band name? Because I keep showing up to do concerts, and people are like, who are you? I go, Mike Donnie, who? I go, 10th Avenue North. I think, oh. Although usually it's not. It's like, who? <laughs> <laughs> just keeps going. Remember Stones, Coldplay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were, we were. That was a joke. We did have some hits, but, oh. but not on that level. Let's talk a little bit about family. Let's talk about it. Four daughters. Yes. I have a daughter and a son. Good for you. I have no idea in terms of four daughters. How does, how, how does a dad manage four daughters? Or I, I don't. They manage me. I, I, they just do whatever they want. It's five I'm to just, one against you, dude. I'm, I'm sorry. Just, and our dog's a girl, so it's six. I'm just getting dragged along. I don't know. I don't know what's happening. Honestly, I read this really great thing in a book, this counselor who just works with teenage girls, and this was a really helpful analogy. They said, raising a daughter is going to feel like you're the side of a pool. So one second, your kid's going to be clinging to you. Oh, daddy, I love you. And then the next second, they're going to be kicking off from the side of the pool going, I want to do this on my own. And then they'll get dunked. Something scary will happen. And they'll come back. <laughs> so I'm a side of a pool. That's OK. I, yeah. And they feel comfortable in that role? You know that's? I do feel comfortable. You know, I think my parenting uh, advice would be be interested. That's really it. I mean, all the guys I know who are older than me have a bunch of like grown children who have a really good relationship. I go, what's the secret? And they go, be interested. Just be interested in what they're interested in. So I'm interested in a lot of things I didn't imagine myself being interested in. You yeah. know, I watch a lot of princess movies and there's a lot of dress up and lots of talks about menstruation. Okay. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that on this, but yeah. I just did. Um, <laughs> So just, you know, talk about lots of things I didn't see myself talking about, but it's have, great. I mean, if you've shared this on social media, forgive me, I didn't see it. Have you done the whole let's make up daddy? And uh, You know, they haven't ever wanted to do that. They love to play makeup, dress up, but right. they, they actually haven't asked me to do that. And I'm not inserting myself into that. You know, I don't feel any need to. Uh, go David Bowie, you know. <laughs> Labyrinth, remember that movie? Oh, With yeah. the Muppets? Yeah. Oh, oh man. Who's the, who's the disciplinarian? Is it good cop, bad cop between you and your wife? You know, or? it's really not. Maybe she would disagree with this, but I, th I feel like we share the load. I'm not like pushover. I thought I would be. Okay. But I had three sisters, four sisters, four sisters. Uh, and so maybe I'm just ready for it. I don't know. Okay. You're not subject to their games. I'm probably lesbian. I'm probably more of a pushover than my wife, but yeah. I'm not a total pushover. Okay. So not the little finger they got you wrapped around. It's been yeah, <laughs> yeah. More the ring finger. Yeah. And then uh, I guess to wrap up here, finding God's life for your will, his presence in the plan. I wanted to get the title right. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's his book. You almost got it. Finding God's life for my will. But yeah, everyone switched it. Finding God's life for my will. That's the flip. Because we're, yeah, we're all trying to say, what is God's will for my life? And you're saying. This is the wrong question. Wrong question. His will for your life, it says it in a bunch of places in Scripture. His will for your life is to be grateful. His will for your life is your sanctification. His will for your life is, uh, what does the Lord require of you? Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. And we go, no, no, no. Tell me the plan. And if you really look at Scripture, if it, without faith, is it, it is impossible to please God, okay, mm -hmm. then what is the one thing you need in order to please God? You have to not know everything. Because if you know everything, you can't have faith. Faith depends on a certain uncertainty. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I think for whatever reason, God just loves when his children risk and fall into his arms and 
trust in him. Really, really, anytime you see the word obey or love God and you resubmitted the word trust there, I think that would be more of the ethos of what scripture is all about. It's like, cool, cool, you can tell me all about God. Do you actually trust him with the knowledge you do know? It's like, that's really the crux of the matter. But it's hard. What do you mean it's hard? It's impossible. I mean, I mean Jesus basically said, like, with man, this is impossible, with, with, but all things are possible through Christ, right? So, um, yeah, I just wanted to maybe relieve the burden. I have so many young people, younger people, coming up to me. How did you know? How did you know this was God's will for your life to do music? I said, I did. I don't. Like, what? And I could really boil it down. This great theologian, he just passed away last week. His name is Frederick Beekner, one of my favorites. And he really sums up, my whole book could really just be this quote. I could have just been like, Frederick, <laughs> just each page. Frederick already said it. Frederick already said it. Oh, what in the world? And he said this. He said, you're calling, right? That's, what, that's really what we want to know. What am I called to do with this one life that God's, been, that God's given me? He said, your calling is where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Okay, let me unpack that. Mm -hmm. We get it wrong two ways. We get it wrong if all we ask is, where's my deep gladness? I've even, I've even heard theologians say, what makes you come alive? Right? John Eldridge famous, famously said, he was kind of quoting St. Ignatius, but he said, ask yourself what makes you come alive and go do that because what the world needs are people who've come alive. Because St. Ignatius said, the glory of God is man fully alive. But that's actually only half the equation. Mm. Because if that's all you ask, like what makes me fully come, well, you could end up doing a bunch of narcissistic, selfish stuff. That doesn't help anybody. Yeah. That's just you, 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 you. But on the flip side, there are people who go selflessness, selflessness. It doesn't matter what I want. It doesn't matter how God's wired me or you know, designed me, even though, sorry, this is a little bit long of an answer. Ephesians 2.10 says, you are Christ's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he has prepared for you in advance that you may walk in them. In other words, you are uniquely uh, drawn up, designed. There's good works that God has created for you, and all you have to do is say yes to them. But So let me finish this. So you either say, what makes me come alive? What makes me happy? That's what I'm going to do. That makes you selfish and a narcissist. So you go the other way. Okay, what does the world need? Oh, there's starving people in Africa? I got to go do that, even though I hate Africa even though I, I hate sleeping in a hut. Even, and, and maybe God would change your desires. But the point is, you end up going and trying to fill needs that you're actually not equipped or wired to do. So the sweet spot, I think, is when you say, what do I love? What makes me come alive? How can I do that in a way that actually serves the world's needs? And that's when you get a fully alive person who's fully uh, giving their lives to help, you know, Institute the kingdom of God. Awesome. Yeah. If you want to hug now? <laughs> yes. Yes. So much bigger than me. <laughs> I'm sure I'll edit that out. But that, how's that's that keep it. That's, that's the part that's going to go viral on TikTok. <laughs> that whole interview, that, it's that last three seconds. That's, that's what's going to really get the numbers. Up. <laughs>